the first lecture in the course is really going to be sort of a taster of many of the things that you will uh, go into more detail in from the other lecturers. Um, I want to give you a general overview of neutron scattering, um, why we use neutrons, uh, what types of methods are available, how we produce neutrons, uh, and then give you a conceptual overview um, and essentially some, some, some initial reference material for the some uh, small angle scattering and how that how that actually works. Um, and then in the further lectures, you will hear in more detail about some of the topics that uh, that I bring up today. OK, so let's talk a little bit first about uh, neutrons and X-rays. Um, people are most familiar with X-rays uh, simply from the fact that I think pretty much everybody at some point has had uh, a medical X-ray of some kind, be it a dental one or a uh, uh, something to do with uh, uh, bone breakage or damage or something like that. Um, but neutrons are, are perhaps less familiar. So um, if we, we start talking about uh, the, the comparison between the two, uh, it'll perhaps give you a feel, uh, intu more intuitive feel for uh, the properties of the neutron. So neutrons themselves uh, were discovered uh, in the 1920s um, by James Chadwick. Um, they'd been predicted by Ernest Rutherford. Uh, he had seen uh, in some gold foil experiments that uh, there must have been uh, something else uh, other than the charged particles that were known at the time. And um, in 1923, Chadwick set up an experiment where he used a source of alpha particles hitting beryllium um, and passing through paraffin uh, to then show that there were indeed particles that could only be these neutral um, subatomic particles that were uh, christened neutrons. And Chadwick received the Nobel Prize in, in physics uh, for this discovery. Um, and here we have some comparisons between the properties of neutrons and X-rays. And I think the key um, uh, items to consider are the fact that, uh, firstly, the neutron has mass, whereas the X-ray uh, does not. Um, neutrons uh, travel at non-relativistic speeds. Their velocities are, are uh, slower than the speed of light, whereas X-rays travel at the speed of light. Um, neutrons have a, have a are spin half, and this becomes important when uh, they're about their interactions with, with uh, atoms. Uh, neutrons have a magnetic moment. Uh, this is very important, and this is the basis of everything that uh, uh, Elizabeth will tell you about when she talks about uh, magnetic small angle scattering. Um, and then I'll say a little bit more about these uh, these energy ranges in a minute. Um, so if we look at X-rays, they were they were discovered uh, uh, twenty years earlier, uh, thirty years earlier, by uh, Wilhelm Röntgen um, when he was studying cathode ray tubes. Uh, and he also got the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, for this award. In fact, it was the first Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for uh, the discovery of X-rays. Uh, so in general, discovering fundamental particles uh, or new forms of radiation is a good way to get a Nobel Prize if you're, if you're angling for one. Um, we then need to talk a little bit about how uh, neutrons and X-rays interact with atoms. So in the case of X-rays, uh, they're electromagnetic radiation, so they interact with the charge cloud uh, around the outside of an atom. Um, uh, whereas neutrons, uh, being neutral, are not affected by the charge cloud uh, and can directly interact with the nucleus of an atom. Uh, the one uh, uh, case where, in fact, they do interact uh, with uh, the electron system is in magnetic scattering, and you'll hear more about that later in the week. Um, the uh, interaction uh, between um, uh, neutrons and the nucleus is a complicated one, uh, determined by the uh, nuclear energy levels uh, and the exact structure of the nucleus. Uh, and as a result, um, what we see is the fact that the, the interaction varies somewhat haphazardly uh, across the uh, periodic table. If we look at this uh, plot on the left-hand side, 
what we see is the fact that uh, here we the neutron scattering length, which I'll explain a bit later, um, varies uh, in this haphazard manner across the periodic table. It can vary wildly from one element to the next um, and even vary from one isotope to another. And this is an important uh, fact in the uh, use of neutrons, scat uh, neutrons for uh, material science. X-rays, on the other hand, because they interact with the electron cloud, uh, their interaction simply goes as the number of electrons. So it just goes as the atomic number of the, uh, of the atom. Um, and what this means is that adjacent uh, uh, nuclei in the periodic table have very similar uh, X-ray uh, uh, scattering uh, factors, uh, whereas uh, for neutrons, they may have very different ones. Um, and this provides a different degree of chemical sensitivity between the two uh, probes, uh, where neutrons can actually often be much more chemically sensitive. On the right-hand side, we have a sort of pictorial representation of uh, what we call the cross-section. And this is essentially, uh, you can think of it as, as how big uh, an atom looks. Um, you know, if you imagine you're throwing a tennis ball at something, uh, the, the bigger the thing is, the more likely you are to hit it. Um, here, this is uh, not a representation of the physical size of the nucleus, but um, a representation of the strength of the interaction, and thus how big, in inverted commas, uh, it looks uh, when you uh, fire neutrons at it. Um, and what we see here is that um, we see this uh, variation being different for X-rays in green and neutrons in red. And in fact, what we can see is the fact that, for instance, for X-rays, for hydrogen deuterium, uh, you have a situation where, because they have the same number of electrons, the cross-section is identical. Um, whereas it turns out that for neutrons, hydrogen has a much larger cross-section than that of deuterium. Uh, and in fact, also, if we look at its scattering length, hydrogen is negative, whereas uh, deuterium is positive. And this allows us to uh, play some interesting games with the uh, neutron refractive index um, that we allows us to uh, change how our sample scatters the neutrons and control it. The other useful fact is the fact that we have uh, relatively low cross sections for some key metallic elements, such as aluminium and iron. Um, this means that we can uh, probe through materials that would not be transparent uh, if we were using x-rays. So materials that uh, X-rays will be absorbed by neutrons can often penetrate. And there are materials, of course, that uh, neutrons uh, don't penetrate, but, but X-rays do, um, such as uh, boron, for instance. Um, I clicked on the wrong button. There we go. Um, if we now look at um, the properties of the neutrons and X-rays that we actually use experimentally, um, of course, neutrons can have a very wide range of energies, uh, as can uh, uh, X-ray photons. Um, but here I'm focusing on the, the energy ranges that we actually use for experiments. In the case of neutrons, it's on the order of milli electron volts to electron volts. Um, whereas for X-rays, it's on the order of, of, of tens of electron volts to kilo electron volts. Um, uh, this, you can see here that the, 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 the X-rays we use have a significantly higher energy. Um, however, if we look at what that means in terms of wavelength, those are very similar wavelengths. So what this means is that in the case of um, uh, the structures we can probe, we can probe the same length scales. We can probe the atomic to uh, macroscopic length scales using both X-rays and neutrons. Um, but the neutrons we use have a much lower energy. Uh, and this plays importantly into a whole range of techniques that I'll come to later called uh, neutron spectroscopy methods, um, which don't really have any analogs in the X-ray world. It also means that the X-rays have the potential to do a lot more damage to your sample by depositing a lot more energy into it. Um, and then the other aspect is the question of source brightness. So neutron sources, 
for the experiments we do today range from 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 14 neutrons per square centimeter per second per steradian per uh, angstrom of bandwidth. Uh, whereas photons uh, from uh, uh, lab and synchrotron sources range from sort of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 20 photons per square millimeter per second per milliradian uh, per 0.1 percent bandwidth. Um, and at first glance, you might say, well, those are similar. But of course, I cheated um, by using different units. So uh, if you can see here for the neutrons, I chose per square centimeter and per steradian, uh, whereas for the photons, it's per square millimeter and per milliradian. And also the bandwidth is uh, much narrower for the photon uh, measurement. And what this means is that uh, modern um, new, uh, X-ray sources are probably about 10 orders of magnitude brighter than modern uh, neutron sources. Um, and this lends, it's, uh, this folds itself into the way we design uh, experiments and the types of experiments we can potentially do. And I'll talk more about um, uh, sources a little bit later. So what does this all mean in reality? Um, well, what it means is that uh, neutrons and X-rays uh, see things differently. And if we just look at the macroscopic question of radiography, which is probably what you're most familiar with, uh, uh, the type of things you would do with uh, medical x-rays, uh, we can do things similarly. So on the left here, you can see uh, this is actually a boiling coffee pot uh, with neutron radiography. Um, and you can see we see right through the aluminium of the um, uh, mocha pot, um, that small cross section, uh, whereas uh, the water containing uh, coffee, uh, or the water, in fact, going through the coffee, um, is uh, has a lot of hydrogen in it uh, and thus is much less transparent because of that large hydrogen cross-section. Um, another example here is we take the same um, item, in this case a small uh, motor, uh, and we can uh, look at it uh, with both x-rays and neutrons. And uh, the x-rays and neutrons are able to highlight different parts of the structure depending upon the, the relative interaction of the neutrons and x-rays with uh, the materials. And the last, last example here is a uh, rifle cartridge. Uh, so here you see with the x-rays that the brass and lead are strongly attenuating, um, whereas for neutrons, the brass and lead are actually relatively transparent, uh, but the gunpowder is um, uh, uh, similarly uh, not so transparent and we can actually then uh, see inside uh, materials that would otherwise not be uh, transparent. Um, and this actually has a lot of um, uh, scientific applications and using radiography um, in things such as looking at the motion of water in fuel cells uh, or the uh, motion of lithium uh, in lithium ion batteries. <clears throat> so um, this means that um, uh, we can actually um, have different views of the material depending upon whether we use neutrons or X-rays. We can also have different views of the material using just neutrons. I mentioned before that hydrogen and deuterium have opposite signs of their scattering length. Uh, and what this means in effect is the fact that we can make their refractive indices cancel out. Um, and so here you can see on the left that Lola uh, she has made sure that her refractive index is the same as her surroundings, uh, whereas Harold, unfortunately, has not. Um, and so the neutron monster will, will eat Harold, uh, interact strongly with him, but will not interact uh, uh, so strongly with uh, uh, Lola. Uh, and what we do, what we call this is, uh, we call this contrast variation, and this is something that Adrian will talk about in his lecture. But um, we make use of selective deuteration to hide and show different parts of our sample. Uh, and we can also combine X-ray and neutron measurements on the same sample uh, to get more information. All right, so that is a very brief overview of why we might use neutrons and how they compare to X-rays. Um, and so the next thing I'm going to talk about is the different types of neutron sources. Um, neutrons 
typically are bound up in the uh, nucleus of atoms, and we have to get them out in order to be able to make use of them for our uh, experiments to make beams of neutrons. And there are a number of different ways that we can obtain uh, free neutrons. The one perhaps that you are most uh, familiar with uh, is nuclear fission. Uh, so here you take a, an element that readily decays with neutron release. Um, and then uh, in particular, when you bombard it with a further neutron, uh, well, with a neutron, it will also um, split. And so we can generate a chain reaction whereby uh, we start uh, uh, one atom um, uh, splitting uh, and then you get a chain reaction as it produces three neutrons, which can then go on to uh, split other atoms. Um, and of course, we need to control this uh, in nuclear weapons. This is an, uh, an uncontrolled release of energy, whereas uh, in nuclear reactors, we put some absorbing materials in amongst the uh, uranium uh, in order to uh, control uh, the rate of uh, that, that chain reaction. Uh, so that it removes some of the neutrons. Um, and then what we do is we, uh, we in a, in a uh, normal power reactor, uh, those neutrons uh, will interact with material and generate heat. Um, in the case of a research reactor, uh, what we want to do is, is let, let those neutrons out so we can use them. Um, another way of producing uh, neutrons is uh, nuclear fusion. This is, of course, what happens uh, in stars, um, but uh, there are lots of uh, work ongoing to try and have uh, fusion uh, sources on Earth, primarily for power production. Uh, here, what we do is we take uh, something like deuterium and tritium uh, and fuse them under high temperature and or high pressure um, in order to uh, cause them to uh, react and produce a neutron and a helium atom. And this high energy neutron um, in a power reactor then goes on to interact with um, uh, lithium, uh, which then produces uh, some uh, a tritium uh, atom, which can be reused, and uh, heat, which can be used for generating power. Um, these are not really practical, uh, well, as, as neutron sources. Um, they're, they're terribly complex and they don't produce uh, very many, uh, a very good yield of neutrons. Um, and the final uh, uh, primary way we produce uh, neutrons is through spallation. Um, and um, the European Spallation Source, which is uh, where I work, is the source we're building here in London, that will make use of this method, it's, it's in the name. Um, so here we take a high energy pulse proton beam and we fire that onto a heavy metal target. Um, and what this does is this destabilizes the uh, nucleus uh, and causes it to uh, give off a huge range of subatomic particles, including a lot of neutrons. Uh, the reason we use heavy metals is because they contain a lot of neutrons. Um, and um, this word spallation comes from uh, geology where it means sort of chipping away at something. Um, there are several uh, working spallation sources in the world at the moment. Uh, the one in Europe, the primary one in Europe is the ISIS facility, um, but also there's the, Paul, the SYNQ facility at Port, the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland. Um, and the last way we can uh, uh, produce uh, uh, neutrons is essentially the same way that Chadwick did. Um, we can um, bombard a light element uh, like uh, beryllium, uh, have it undergo a nuclear reaction uh, and produce uh, neutrons. Um, we don't use uh, helium or alpha particles uh, so much these days. Um, what we do do though, is we take a proton beam, a, but a lower energy proton beam than we use in spallation sources um, and bombard ber beryllium targets, which then undergoes a reaction uh, that produces neutrons. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, these are what we call low energy neutron sources or compact accelerator driven neutron sources. And these are actually uh, of the scale that could be uh, built at a university. Um, so you could more or less have a, a laboratory scale um, a neutron source. I mean, they're still fairly big. Um, you need a, a low energy uh, proton accelerator, but 
um, a number of sources around the world are being built with repurposed uh, research accelerators at universities. So in terms of the um, high flux sources that you actually uh, will likely mostly use for doing experiments, uh, the two types we have are reactors and spallation sources. In both cases, we have a central source of neutron production um, around which uh, basically we put holes in the wall, let the neutrons out, um, and um, can then direct them to uh, experiments. Um, however, uh, if we look at the energies that are involved in uh, both of those types of re reactions, um, the neutrons that are produced are in the mega electron volt to the giga electron volt range. Um, and I said earlier that the ones we want to use for experiments are actually in the milli electron volt range. And so what we have to do is we need to lower the energy. Um, and so we use what we call a moderator. Um, and essentially what this is, is this is a hydrogen containing uh, material. Remember that large cross section I mentioned? Um, that we keep at a specific temperature. Uh, and then by uh, the interaction of the neutrons with those hydrogen nuclei, uh, they will uh, uh, interact, lose some energy, and eventually um, uh, end up with an energy distribution that is representative of the thermal energy in the moderator. Uh, and so if we want lower energy, uh, neutrons, we use a uh, lower energy, uh, low, lower thermal energy source. So we use something cold. Um, and this is usually something like um, liquid hydrogen or liquid deuterium, um, or possibly uh, solid methane. Um, if we want a slightly higher energy uh, neutrons, we use uh, what we call a thermal uh, source, uh, thermal moderator, and that's usually just water at room temperature. Um, so we basically pass the neutrons through a bucket of water um, and they rattle around inside and uh, their energy goes down to something similar to the, uh, the, the Boltzmann distribution of energies in, in water. Um, and uh, if we want slightly higher energy still, uh, so these are wavelengths on a, a, a fraction of an angstrom, um, then uh, we use what we call a hot source, which is actually we take graphite and heat it up uh, to about a thousand Kelvin and, or, or higher. Um, and so then this uh, then uh, adjusts the energy of the neutrons down to, uh, to a energy distribution that's represented by, by that temperature. Um, and so all this, all this is to say is that we have a way of producing uh, neutrons from the source that have varying uh, wavelengths uh, and equivalent energies. Um, and so depending on the type of experiment we want to do, uh, we can make use of different uh, neutron sources. So uh, where can you go and do uh, such experiments? Uh, you can see that there are actually quite a lot of uh, sources around the world. Um, and unfortunately, some of these have now started to shut down. Uh, the Canadian's uh, Neutron Beam Center has closed. Uh, Los Alamos National Lab has closed to external users. Um, the LLB in uh, France has, uh, has closed its reactor, but they are working on a compact accelerator source. Uh, and the Helmholtz Center in Berlin has also uh, 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 closed uh, in the recent years. Um, but there are many other sources you can go to. They're distributed more or less everywhere. Um, there are sources in uh, South America and in Africa, uh, as well as in Australia, Asia. Uh, but you can see there's a very high density of sources in Europe. Um, and, and, and as a result, neutron scattering as a community is, is actually very strong uh, in Europe. And there is a, a large uh, research base, um, which was uh, made it a natural source uh, place to build um, a place like ESS. So why are we building new neutron sources? What's wrong with the old ones? Well, as you heard, some are closing. They get old um, and nuclear reactors are getting less pop popular. Um, and uh, at some point, the refurbishment costs uh, outweigh the benefits. Um, 
And the other reason is that we want to try and produce higher and higher fluxes of neutrons. So I mentioned before that the source brightness for neutrons was many odds of magnitude below that of X-rays. Um, and many of the techniques we use with neutrons are limited by the number of neutrons per second we can actually get onto our sample. And so we always want uh, brighter and brighter sources. Um, and this plot uh, shows uh, the brightness of sources all the way from Chadwick's uh, source uh, up through uh, reactors uh, here uh, and um, spallation sources here. And you might be wondering, why can't we make the reactor sources brighter? Um, and the reason for that is simply that uh, I mentioned before that the neutrons interact and produce heat. And at some point, we can't, uh, we're generating more heat than we can take away. Um, in power reactors, uh, they produce an awful lot of heat. They might have giga, uh, gigawatt um, uh, power levels compared to the maybe 20 to 100 megawatt levels, power levels from a um, research reactor. And um, the way they achieve this in power reactors is that they make the cores bigger because all they're interested in is the total amount of heat produced. However, this doesn't increase the uh, number of neutrons per unit volume of, of, of reactor core. And that's what we need for uh, doing our experiments faster. We need brighter sources of neutrons, not just more neutrons overall. We need more neutrons coming out per unit volume. And we've really reached a limit with nuclear reactor design uh, in terms of how dense we can make the reactor cores while still extracting the heat. And this is where spallation sources come in. Um, these allow us to, because they produce uh, many more neutrons uh, for each proton we can put in, uh, we can in, uh, produce, put more and more protons in and get more and more neutrons out. Of course, we still reach some uh, limits um, and ESS, one of the main challenges we have is uh, whilst we're aiming to be the brightest neutron source in the world, we are having challenges with uh, removing the heat. And so we have a very unique source design um, in order to allow us to get rid of the heat that's produced um, in the spallation process. Um, but this is, in general, we see that the, the brightness of um, spallation sources is on the rise. And there are some uh, developments also now in the US with the second target station at uh, uh, SNS, where they will be able to produce um, uh, even brighter beams, uh, but for much shorter durations. <clears throat> so uh, an example of a, a neutron source, uh, spallation source is the ISIS source. Um, this is what we call a short pulse source. So the pulse is um, uh, hundreds of microseconds long um, and you, uh, the, the source operates at 50 Hertz. So you get 50 pulses a second. Um, it has a variety of moderators as we discussed. Uh, and um, uh, over 30 instruments that make use of those sources. And so you can see here, we have a linear accelerator uh, that produces the protons. These get put into a synchrotron to bunch them up and store them. And then they get extracted and sent to two target stations uh, around which the neut uh, neutron instruments are placed. Um, so it really is, you know, the neutrons are produced here. They hit the moderator, they go off in all directions and then we take whatever comes out of the hole and guide it to uh, the instruments. Uh, in terms of a sort of canonical reactor source, uh, the Institut La Langevin in Grenoble in France is um, uh, probably the world's leading uh, reactor neutron source. Uh, it's a 58 megawatt reactor and was a, a post-war project between France, Germany and the UK um, with also it now has uh, 12 scientific members, including Sweden. Um, and um, this, uh, you can see here, it has the reactor core uh, with a series of, of moderators around it. Uh, and then a number of instruments, both close to the reactor and further out, that are all viewing these sources of neutrons. Right. So, that's been a, a whirlwind tour of um, how we produce neutrons. Uh, 
So I'm just going to finish up now by saying a little bit about uh, what we do with them, and in particular, uh, some of uh, aspects of small angle scattering that you'll need to consider. So there are a huge range of methods um, that can then uh, take advantage of the fact that uh, the neutrons interact with nuclei and are scattered uh, or absorbed, uh, and uh, they can allow us to look at the structure of, of materials all the way from the atomic scale using diffraction methods through the nanometer scale with sands and surface structures with reflectometry, uh, all the way into the macroscopic regime with, with imaging. <clears throat> but I mentioned before also that neutrons have a relatively low energy. Um, and what this means is the fact that we also can perform uh, experiments where we uh, look at how the energy of the neutron changes when it interacts with uh, the sample. And these are spectroscopy techniques. Um, and these allow us to measure the way that atoms, in the case of uh, time of flight and crystal spectroscopy, or molecules, in the case of spin echo spectroscopy, uh, and length scales in between, move. Um, and you'll see there's this diagonal correlation. Um, and this is because the uh, shorter wavelength neutrons are good at measuring atomic structures, but, and they end up having energies that are useful for measuring atomic motions. Whereas the, the longer wavelength neutrons are good for measuring small uh, uh, nanometer scale structures. Uh, and these have energies that are also then useful for measuring motion on the nanometer length scale, so motion of, of uh, molecules. And so what this means is we say that um, neutrons allow us to measure the geometry of motion uh, because the uh, length scale and energy are well matched so that we probe both the, uh, have the right energy to probe the motions at the same time as we can probe the right length scale. Um, in terms of structural measurements, there are X-ray equivalents of all of these neutron techniques. Um, in terms of uh, uh, spectroscopy, um, there aren't so many X-ray techniques that are similar. And this is because of the much higher energy of the X-rays. Um, and so we simply aren't in the right energy regime to look at these very small uh, energies um, that are related to the motion of, of atoms and molecules. Um, there are other techniques that are similar. So for instance, dynamic light scattering and spin echo uh, can often overlap in their regime. Uh, there are methods like NMR and various other spectra, uh, optical spec and other optical spectroscopies that uh, can also uh, align with some of these other methods. So I mentioned all these different techniques. Um, and I mentioned also that we can measure the fact that the energy changes. Um, but what do we really measure in a neutron scattering experiment? And fundamentally, all neutron scattering experiments, apart from perhaps radiography, um, are the same. We have an incident beam of neutrons that some, have some energy and some uh, wave vector. Um, they hit the sample. And then they leave the sample with some other energy and some other wave vector. Um, and what we measure then is uh, the change in energy and or the change in direction or change in wave vector of the, um, uh, of the neutrons. Um, and we measure their change in uh, wave vector as a function of this variable we call Q which is essentially just literally the, uh, the difference uh, between the incoming and outgoing wave vectors in vectorial terms. And if we look at how the intensity of scattering varies as a function of Q, it turns out that this is related to the Fourier transform of how the atoms and molecules are arranged in our sample. This gives us correlations in space. On the other hand, we can also look at how the energy of the neutron changes. Uh, and we, we, we talk about the energy transfer omega. Uh, and um, if we look at the intensity of uh, scattering as a function of omega, this then turns out to be related to the Fourier transform of how stuff is arranged in time. Uh, so we can look at correlations in time. <clears throat> 
If you've done any um, dynamic light scattering, it's very similar to the, the autocorrelation functions we look at uh, in uh, dynamic light scattering. So we can look at how the direction of a neutron beam changes and how its energy changes. Um, but there are different uh, ways in which its energy can change. So um, it could not change at all. We could have a purely elastic interaction. Um, and um, this is primarily what we think of when we think of atomic diffraction. Uh, so here we're getting no information about the motion of uh, the atoms. All we're seeing is uh, the information about their positions. If we have a crystalline material, such as um, you know, a salt crystal or something like this, um, they, the atoms are not actually stationary uh, at any real temperature. Um, what they are is that they are all vibrating. Um, and they tend to vibrate in collective modes, uh, we refer to as phonons. Um, but it means that, in fact, the, these uh, vibrations are both collective and also quantized. And so when we do see an energy change in the neutron beam, it ends up being peaked at very specific energies. Um, and this uh, uh, structure of peaks uh, tells us about those collective motions of the atoms. If we have something like a liquid or a gas, however, uh, what we don't have this quantized discrete set of motions. We have a Boltzmann distribution of, um, of energies, as I mentioned before with the moderators, right? We make use of that. Um, but that is then a broad distribution of energies. And what we see then is that the uh, energy of the neutron beam uh, isn't uh, really re produced in a quantized way but is spread out uh, in uh, a distribution of energies. And this is what we call quasi-elastic scattering. And the distribution of this, the width of this distribution, its shape tells us about the distribution of energies and motions in the sample. All right. So I mentioned at the beginning that neutrons scatter from nuclei. So what does that really mean? Um, essentially, if we treat our um, uh, neutron beam as an instant plane wave, it comes in, it scatters off the nucleus. The nucleus is very small compared to the wavelength of the neutron beam. Uh, and so we get a point-like scattering effect with a spherical scattered wave uh, where the, uh, the, the equation of the wave is given here. And here we see that the scattering length comes in and it represents the interaction of the neutron with the nucleus. The sign of, the, of this is actually arbitrary, but was chosen such that most elements are positive. Um, and we've seen before that they vary uh, across the periodic table uh, in this uh, haphazard way. But the most useful difference is between hydrogen and deuterium, where one is negative and one is positive. Single nuclei are um, uh, interesting, but what happens if we look at multiple nuclei? Um, uh, and also, um, what is this cross-section that uh, I mentioned at the beginning with those little pictures of disks? Um, so it, we define the cross-section here as being um, the total number of neutrons that are scattered per second uh, divided by the incident number of neutrons per second. So here we have our incident neutron beam. It interacts with the sample, and it's scattered in some direction, theta phi. Uh, and uh, into some solid angle, uh, ds, um, oh, sorry, some solid angle, d omega. Um, and so we can measure in our experiment the differential cross-section. So we measure the differential of the cross-section with respect to solid angle. Um, and then the total cross-section, as I say, is given by the integral of the differential cross-section over all angles. Um, and so when we take again our uh, single nucleus, uh, we can calculate out based upon uh, the properties of the incoming beam and the properties of the scattered beam, um, what the scattering cross-section is. And so the differential cross-section ends, ends up as being simply uh, the square of the scattering length. 
And so then the total cross section when we integrate over four pi star radians, a full sphere, ends up being four pi times the square of the scattering length. This simple case, however, only holds when uh, we have one isotope or one element that has zero nuclear spin present. Uh, and the presence of multiple isotopes and multiple elements or non-zero spin uh, actually leads us to having a coherent and incoherent part of the cross section, where the coherent part is this bit uh, and it provides structural information, whereas the incoherent part describes the variations uh, around the mean scattering length and uh, is, uh, um, does not provide structural information. Okay. So if we take more than one scatterer, then basically what we do is we simply, we sum up all of the scattered waves from all of the atoms in the sample, right? Um, and uh, uh, modulated by the, uh, the distance between them and the differences in their scattering vectors. Um, uh, we do that same calculation for the differential cross sections as we did before, and we end up here with what is sort of the fundamental equation of uh, one of the fundamental equations of scattering, which is that the differential cross section as a function of Q is simply uh, uh, related to uh, the sum of all of the scattering lengths and their relative positions. I'll briefly mention here coherent and incoherent scattering. Uh, this is here for your reference, but essentially, uh, if we work through where there are variations in uh, scattering length uh, across the um, um, sample, uh, then uh, we end up with a situation where uh, we have a component that is uh, dependent purely upon the average scattering length squared. And this is the coherent scattering term I mentioned before. Um, but here we end up with a, a term that is not um, uh, does not have any um, dependence upon scattering angle uh, and is simply related to the average of the square of the um, uh, scattering length uh, subtracted by the square of the average. So basically it is the, the average deviation from, from the mean. And that has no information in it, but does produce uh, background in our scattering experiments. All right. So we saw before that uh, to calculate the scattering or we just sum up the scattering lengths of all of the atoms uh, and know where all the atoms are. Um, that is uh, kind of tricky if you don't have an ordered structure so it doesn't repeat uh, and you are interested actually in length scales that are longer than atomic distances. So what we want is a bulk property that we can use to describe the scattering. And the one we choose is what we call scattering density. And it is exactly what it sounds. It's the total scattering length divided by the volume. And um, what this means is that in small angle scattering, because we're looking at structures that are large enough, uh, we can make use of this instead of having to worry about all the individual atomic scattering lengths. And the way this works is that if you imagine we have water, we start by sitting on oxygen and just use the volume around oxygen. Oxygen has a positive scattering length. Um, uh, if we increase the site radius of our, our sampling uh, volume, uh, then we include some hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen is negative, so we, it takes it negative. If we make it a bit bigger, we're now including more oxygen, it goes positive, make it a bit bigger, more hydrogen and so on until eventually we're sampling enough that we lose the details of the atomic structure. And we're now simply looking at the, the average of the uh, molecular structure. And so as long as we're looking on sufficiently long length scales, we can use scattering density rather than having to worry about where all the individual atoms are. So we take that equation from before, the differential scattering cross section, um, and we integrate it uh, using the scattering density distribution across the whole sample, normalized by that total sample volume because we've done uh, by sample volume. And we end up with what we call the macroscopic cross-section with the big sigma in it. Um, 
And this is rel then related to the distribution of scattering density in the sample. And we call this is the, called the Raleigh Gans equation. And this is the sort of fundamental message I want you to take away from, and that is that small angle scattering is a result of inhomogeneities in scattering, then, scattering length density. Uh, the neutron beam knows nothing about your sample other than that the scattering density varies with spa in space. It's up to you to turn that information into something about your structure. And we see here, this is now, as you can see, this is essentially now the Fourier transform of the scattering, scattering density distribution in the sample. So as a last uh, point, I just want to talk about uh, SANS versus SACS, which is really neutrons versus X-rays. Uh, both methods of measurement provide us with similar information. Uh, we get structural information on the um, nanometer to micrometer length scale. Um, the difference is in how the radiation interacts with the sample. In the case of neutrons, they scatter from nuclei. Case of uh, uh, X rays, they scatter from electrons. Uh, we have a variation of neutron scattering length, uh, which varies from element to element and isotope to isotope in a way that is um, haphazard across the periodic table. Uh, and then the X ray form factor, which is the equivalent for X rays, this is simply a linear dependence upon the number of electrons. We rarely need to worry about the absorption of neutrons. Um, there are certain elements that do absorb neutrons, but we don't mostly don't have to worry about them. Uh, and whereas the absorption of X-rays is common and has to be considered in the analysis, and this is uh, an, an additional term in the scattering length density. Our flux of neutrons, we talked about the brightness of neutron sources versus uh, X-rays. In general, it limits the rate of data collection and means we need to have much larger beams. Whereas with X-rays, we can make extremely fast measurements uh, or low concentrations or look at very small samples. With neutrons, there's essentially no concern about damaging our sample with the beam. Whereas in the case of X-rays, because of the high energy and strong interact and strong absorption, uh, then potentially we will be depositing a lot of energy in and we could damage our sample. So in summary, that was sort of a introduction to the uh, why we use neutrons, how we produce neutrons, um, a very quick uh, overview of how neutrons interact with um, matter and some of the key uh, equations and uh, concepts such as scattering length and scattering density um, that you need to know to be able to uh, do uh, small angle scattering data analysis uh, and perform small angle scattering experiments. Um, so any questions? Or have you all fallen asleep? Is anybody there? <laughs> I got a thumbs up, good. <laughs> Somebody's there. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, well, if there are no questions uh, on that, then um, uh, we have a half hour break now. Uh, well, 20 minutes, I'm afraid, because I ran over. My apologies. Uh, and at 1030, Adrian will uh, start to give you more information on those things such as scaffolding density and contrast variation and how we uh, compare sands and sacks. So, uh, I'll I'll talk to you later and um, uh, have a good break. Thanks. <laughs>